live. Um, my name my name is Kate Esselin, and I'm one of the G1 oncologists at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. And I also spend some time working at Mount Auburn as well. And I see some familiar uh, names in the um, participants. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's my privilege to get to present to you um, a webinar from our G1 Oncology series on cervical cancer updates on the very last day of Cervical Health and Awareness Month. So my slides, oh, there they go, okay. <laughs> Um, as this audience is probably very familiar, cervical cancer is one of the most preventable and treatable forms of cancer. However, as we're going to review, there's still a lot of work to be done. So I have no financial disclosures related to anything I'm discussing today. And I did want to disclose that there's a lot to talk about here. And unfortunately, I'm not going to have enough time to really get into much detail on the HPV vaccine, screening guidelines, dysplasia management, or fertility sparing treatment options. Each of these would be a talk unto themselves, and I've already jammed way too much into our short hour. So in thinking about updates to cervical cancer, I naturally thought back to sort of where we were when I finished my fellowship uh, in 2015. So almost nine years ago now, so about a decade, uh, and I and thinking back, and I had to look up some of these statistics, but the HPV vaccine at that point had been around nearly a decade, uh, and the non-avalent vaccine was released in 2014 and really started to be used more commonly in 2015 over the quadrivalent vaccine. However, our vaccination rates in 2015 were somewhat low, with only 40% of girls and 21% of boys who had actually received all three recommended doses. In terms of treatment and management of cervical cancer, uh, at that time, uh, early stage disease was being managed uh, with surgical management, pr primarily minimally invasive surgical management with uh, either laparoscopic or robotic assisted, total laparoscopic hysterectomy, and total pelvic lymphadenectomy. The use of sentinel lymph nodes was somewhat exploratory. Uh, in terms of locally advanced disease, and I will describe what these mean in a little bit more detail in a few slides, uh, we were treating with primary chemotherapy and radiation, which is chemotherapy given with radiation to sensitize cells to the radiation and followed by uh, brachytherapy. And finally, metastatic recurrent disease was treated with systemic chemotherapy. And in the year prior or the year of my completion of fellowship, uh, we saw the results from a very exciting randomized study, GOG240, that showed actually, for the first time in a long time, uh, an improved survival of 3.7 months with the addition of bevacizumab to the standard chemotherapy regimens, uh, which at that time was quite an advance. And so in, uh, I hope to bring you up to date from where we were when we finished fellowship um, in the next hour or so. So today we're going to talk about cervical cancer in 2024. We'll briefly review some of the epidemiology, risk factors, pathogenesis, talk about the diagnosis and workup and how it relates to our 2018 staging, which was updated uh, just a few years back. And um, then we'll get into more detail around treatment updates, how treatment has changed, uh, including for early stage disease, locally advanced disease, and metastatic and recurrent. So as most of you know, uh, cervical cancer is really a global problem and a glo the global burden of disease is much greater than here in the US. What you can see here are our global uh, figures from 2020 showing the incidence on the left and on the right, the incidence and the mortality rates uh, from cervical cancer in different regions of the country. On the map, uh, darker blue represents the highest incidences of cervical cancer, which go down as you go down in, in the deepness of the color. So globally in 2020, there were over 600,000 new cases of cervical cancer and 341,000, more than 340 deaths from cervical cancer. While in the US, uh, we had about 12,820 new cases, or we're estimating for this year, 12,820 new cases and 4,360 deaths. 
So as you can see, uh, cervical cancer in the US is not nearly uh, the burden that it is globally. And fortunately here, uh, we show over the last 50 years or so how the incidence and mortality have both declined, largely due in part to our ability to screen uh, for cervical cancer and treat early cancers. We On the right there, you see the uh, rise of screening, although I will draw your attention to that purple line. I don't, I think you can see my um, uh, mouse, but if you can't, I apologize. And it does start to decline a little bit here, something we should keep an eye on, of course. And then the, um, the uh, incidence and, and deaths and mortality also declining with that advent of screening. But no talk about cervical cancer in the United States would be complete without an acknowledgement of the disparities in care that our patients face. Uh, on This is a, a basically a last decade or so um, graph of the trends in mortality from 2000 to 2020. Uh, by race uh, and ethnicity. So the top line is non-Hispanic Black patients and the blue triangles are Hispanic, any race. Uh, and then the blue or teal circles with uh, empty circles are white or non-Hispanic white patients. And what you can see is encouraging in that the mortality rates are declining, but what is very discouraging about this graph, graph are the clear disparities we see um, by race. So again, more work to be done here. So risk factors for cervical cancer, I'm gonna go through this very quickly because I think this is a review for the majority of the participants. Uh, HPV is the primary driver of cervical cancer. So a persistent high-risk HPV infection is the source of nearly all cervical cancers. And folks who are at risk for that are those who are immunocompromised um, or maybe living with HIV. Uh, other um, sources of immunocompromise from transplant patients or chronic conditions. Folks who have had cervical cancer, uh, cer sorry, cervical infections, and then sexual history factors like early onset of sexual activity, increased number of sexual partners, a young age at first pregnancy, and non-HPV uh, mediated risk factors like smoking, OCP use, age, uh, lack of access to screening, lower socioeconomic status, rural community uh, locations, and minoritized communities, all are risk factors for cervical cancer. So, to remind everyone why it is that HPV or how it is that HPV uh, is related to cervical cancer. First of all, we need to acknowledge that HPV is an incredibly common uh, infection that nearly all sexually active men and women will have at some point in their lives. But cervical cancer, as we've just shown you, is actually a relatively rare phenomenon in this country and, and places where we have screening and treatment for early stage disease. So there are over 200 types of subtypes of HPV with about 12 to 24 high, known high-risk subtypes, but really there are even fewer that are known to be strongly associated with cervical cancer. Primarily HPV type 16 and 18 are associated with cervical cancer, about 70% of cervical cancer diagnoses. So this is a nice, uh, simple-ish <laughs> cartoon from a New England Journal article that was actually just published last year, um, which I found to be a great review of HPV. So I'll direct you there if you want further information. But the um, HPV virus we know has a great affinity for the uh, transformation zone in the cervix, and it will infect the cells there. And as mentioned, nearly every sexually active individual will be exposed to HPV at some point. However, fortunately, 90% of HPV infections will be cleared by individuals within one to two years of um, obtaining the infection. And the infection rates are highest in the sort of early onset or time of sexual activity, so in late teens and early 20s. So as many of you know, we don't screen for HPV in this population because we would find it all the time. Uh, and the majority of those uh, individuals are going to clear the infection. So the initial infection in, infects the cells and again is cleared the majority of the time, but occasionally it will persist. And when it persists, it then has the ability, and I, I'm not gonna get into how it regulates E6 and E7, which translate into um, 
blocking tumor suppressor genes and allow, allow for the growth of dysplasia, which is what that third uh, picture is showing you. Uh, and that dysplasia is what we are looking for in the cytology that we do in combined with HPV screening um, in later years. Ultimately, if this is not caught or treated in time, that's when it can progress to cancer um, and invade through the basement membrane and show um, invasive cervical cancers. Again, the other thing I'm not going to go into great detail today is the different subtypes of uh cervical cancer, adenocarcinomas, and squamous cell carcinomas, we're going to jump right into sort of management. Um, but as mentioned, uh, presentation and symptoms of cervical cancer largely depend on sort of the stage of presentation. So you have uh, your majority of early stage lesions are, are actually asymptomatic, often picked up with our screening methods. Um, however, you may hear histories of postcoital bleeding or abnormal vaginal bleeding or discharge um, in those patients and also certainly in your more advanced cervix patients who have pelvic pain, uh, may have unilateral leg swelling or pain, you may have a palpable pelvic mass or a, a certainly a gross cervical lesion. On the right are pictured are some col colposcopic pictures of all cervices uh, with potential cervical cancer in them, and you can see the presentation on visual inspection can be highly variable, which is why we rely on our pathologist to actually help us make the diagnosis of cervical cancer. And that is predominantly done through a colposcopic exam with biopsies of the cervix. Uh, abnormal cells uh, can be further uh, evaluated and potentially treated with cervical excisional procedures, which are depicted here with a LEAP procedure which is often done in the office with electrocautery to remove that small portion of cervix you see there. Uh, and then a cone biopsy is done with a scalpel in the operating room, uh, sometimes called a cold knife cone as a result. Uh, and this provides a little bit uh, often of a larger specimen, but certainly one that can get into the canal of the cervix a bit better and the margins are easier to evaluate given no cautery is used. But I wanted to jump right sort of into where we as G1 oncologists meet patients and what we do, um, hopefully to uh, provide the folks who are generalists and or uh, primary care physicians here uh, a little bit more insight into what happens after you make that referral to us with findings of cervical cancer on one of those excisional biopsies or a colposcopic biopsy and or just a physical exam. So the first thing that happens when uh, we receive one of these consults is we immediately want to review any of the pathology that uh, you have obtained, and we often request those slides and have our GYN pathologist review it here just to uh, confirm the diagnosis. And as you'll see shortly, uh, it's critically important to the staging uh, of these cancers, and so we really want to be sure we're being accurate because it can very much affect what we can offer patients. We Early on in our evaluation, I want to do a physical exam. This is not a patient that I meet in the office and can counsel about what to expect just based on her pathology results. I really need to know what her exam is and, and how things look and feel. Part of that exam, obviously, is the speculum exam uh, shown on that last so slide with the colposcopic exam. But almost more importantly is the physical exam with the with the bimanual exam and a rectovaginal exam where we're really feeling the mass, if, there, if there's one present, feeling for any extension into the parametrial tissues, which is really hard to do on just a routine uh, uh, vaginal exam. Feeling the uterosacral ligaments is often much easier to do through the rectal uh, portion of the exam. And that's where we get a better uh, sense of the local extension of the disease. We also usually get routine labs, which can sometimes be quite important in more advanced disease at assessing uh, kind of, you know, and more late stage findings of renal dysfunction. Uh, HIV testing should be considered if it's not already been done. Uh, the imaging piece uh, varies based on sort of the presentation and the state of disease, but anyone beyond a very early lesion uh, pretty much is going to get a pelvic MRI and hopefully a PET scan. Uh, stage 1A1 and early stage lesions don't always end up with these imaging studies. Well, at least, especially the PET scan, if the insurance companies won't pay for it. Uh, but those are sort of standard 
imaging for a workup of a new diagnosis, at least in the United States. Um, sometimes we may need to get more information and more pathology, depending on how the original biopsy was obtained or what our exam shows us. So for early stage disease, if it's only been on a colposcopic biopsy or there were positive margins on an excisional biopsy, sometimes it's necessary to repeat another excisional biopsy. Most often we would proceed with a cold knife cone, although a leap could be considered in certain circumstances. And then for more advanced disease, if you're concerned about uh, further extension beyond the cervix um, and want to really fully assess, or sometimes patients don't tolerate a, a good office exam, it's necessary to go to the operating room for an exam under anesthesia with a cystoscopy and proctoscopy uh, for uh, you know, higher stage lesions that may be invading into the local structures. It's also important at these first visits to review fertility goals if that is relevant to the patient and consider an expedited referral to uh, our infertility partners because uh, there may be options for them to uh, attempt some uh, pres fertility preservation measures either before treatment or during after certain points of their treatment. And then finally, if they're smokers, we always wanna address that and discuss smoking cessation. So again, given the limited time, I elected to not go too much in detail into the pathology uh, type, subtypes, and um, I'm really going to focus on, for the rest of the talk, on sort of what we actively do to manage these patients, which I hope you'll find helpful for counseling your patients in the future and then in those patients, because we do cure many of these patients, when they come back to you later to sort of understanding what treatment they've been through and um, how you can support them and understand uh, what it is that they've had done. So in 2018, uh, FIGO actually updated their staging system. Uh, not too much, as, as those of you who had to study this as residents or for other reasons, uh, cervix cancer staging was always very complicated with lots of millimeters in the early stages and lots of substages. But broadly speaking, the staging system didn't change too much with this update. And stage one is cervix cancers confined to the cervix. Stage two is slight extension beyond the cervix, but not, uh, too, not too far beyond the cervix is how I like to think of it. So it generally means the out into the parametrial tissues and down into the upper vagina, just adjacent to the cervix. Stage three historically has been more extensive local extension. Um, classically, for, for a favorite question on, uh, on the CREOG exams was if a patient presents with hydronephrosis, what stage is the, she? Well, that suggests that cervix cancer has extended out through the parametrial uh, tissues out to the level of the ureter and is obstructing the ureter causing hydronephrosis. So that's automatically a stage 3B. You may see on imaging evidence of extension to the pelvic sidewall, and sometimes you can really feel this on exam if patient is comfortable enough with your um, exam or you're in the operating room. Uh, and lower third of the vagina is the other stage 3A. And then finally, stage 4 is either local uh, extension that is quite aggressive into the bladder, into the rectum, or 4B is distant spread. So really with the updates, um, all that they did was actually simplify the early stages by removing one of the measurements. They removed the width of the tumor, but stage 1A1 is stromal invasion less than three millimeters in depth, and 1A2 is stromal invasion greater than three millimeters, but less, less than five millimeters, so a, a two millimeter group of patients uh, that... Um, you know, we no longer count width of the tumor in these in these designations. Stage 1B got updated to be more nuanced, actually, to tell us a little bit more about the actual size of the tumor. Um, so that was um, now 1B1 is anything less than two centimeters, but 1B2 is broken up into two to four and then beyond four, which um, has some good clinical relevance that we'll talk about in a few minutes. And then finally, one of the things that I always found very confusing uh, as uh, a resident and fellow and, and beyond, and I think my patients often found confusing is, while you could have a clinical stage 1B tumor, uh, you could also have a positive lymph node, which wasn't really accounted for in the old staging system. 
because the old staging system was really geared at being applicable in almost every resource setting in the world so that you could stage someone uniformly across the globe. And so, of course, there are places that don't have great access to CT scans and other and surgery where you might identify a, a positive pelvic or paroidic lymph node. Uh, however, even in many more limited resource settings, there is some access now, at least to imaging studies that might show this. And it really affects their treatment and it's it was felt to, to appropriate to now include it in the staging system. Uh, and so either radiographic or surgical staging designated with R and P notations for radi radiology and pathology, um, you can now account for their lymph nodes in the staging system, which I do think will help patients understand sometimes our more aggressive treatment plans in spite of their um, lower clinical historic stage. So I will, I think, move ahead here because I'm going to show you that again, only larger. Uh, so stage one um, cervical cancer is surgical treatment whenever possible. There can be appropriate uses of chemo radiation in patients who don't wish to have surgery, um, which can be equally curative in this setting. And the 1B3s are really uh, cases where we need to pause if we are planning surgery, because there are criteria after surgery which warrant uh, additional treatment with chemotherapy and radiation often. And if they, if your tumor is large, is one of the criteria, the said list criteria, which I'm not going to spend time going through today. Uh, but for my fellows on the call, and I see you here, um, you all should be able to at least repeat what some of those risk factors are. And again, anybody with a tumor over four centimeters is is pretty close to meeting said list criteria before you even start. And so the reason we choose uh, not to operate on those patients is because it's likely they're going to meet the criteria that show us that without additional treatment after surgery, they are at higher risk for recurrence. And when you do a sort of multimodality approach here with surgery, radical surgery, as you're going to see, followed by chemotherapy and radiation, the risk of long-term uh, morbidity is quite high. And these patients we hope would survive with all that treatment. And so we really try to, uh, as a rule of thumb, try to select the treatment that they, we think they're only gonna need one of. So either surgery or the chemo radiation approach. And we don't like to um, knowingly sign patients up for all three. So um, the lowest risk cervical cancers are obviously the earliest stage, stage 1A1, less than three millimeters of invasion, as you'll recall. These folks have the lowest risk of nodal metastasis, the lowest risk of recurrence, and the best survival. So we know with these patients, their lesions are quite small. It may be safe to do a simple hysterectomy or cone biopsy, where we are just removing the cervix um, and we often we prefer a hysterectomy if a patient is completed childbearing, but in these patients, it is safe to consider a cone biopsy. And again, the fertility sparing lecture um, is for another day. Um, these patients have such a low, low risk of nodal spread that we don't recommend any lymphadenectomy. Um, and at the end of surgery, in order for them to have completed their treatment, they really need to have negative margins, particularly with the cone, cone biopsy, but also the hysterectomy. And um, there, there may be a role for LEAP, or if a LEAP has negative margins with an extremely small uh, lesion in a patient desiring fertility sparing surgery, this may be sufficient as well. But for the majority of stage one patients, we recommend a radical hysterectomy. And so uh, for those of you non-gynecologists on the call, um, this is a radical hysterectomy specimen. And so the upper part here is the uterine fundus. Uh, there are aren't clear tubes and ovaries attached to that, but those may be removed as well. And then what you see down here is the cervix. There is the cancer. This part that's sort of folded back, which may be a little bit hard to see with the glare, um, is the upper vagina. And it almost looks like there are some lesions extending out to there. Um, there's also uh, the uh, parametrial wings here, which include the blood supply to uh, the uterus, the uterine artery, 
And in addition to that, um, there are lymphatics that run through here and obviously lots of soft tissue. And so a cervical cancer grows up and into the endocervix and can also spread down the vagina and out the parametria, which is why a, a radical hysterectomy, which describes the removal of these additional pieces, um, is necessary. Cervix cancer also likes to spread to the lymph nodes, so a complete pelvic lymphadenectomy is also recommended. Uh, sentinel lymph nodes we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, fertility sparing approaches, as I mentioned, are reasonable to be considered, but really the tumor needs to be less than two centimeters for good oncologic outcomes in those cases. Uh, and other criteria like lymphovascular space invasion, um, lower grade tumors, and depth of invasion less than 10 millimeters, those are all good prognostic signs and uh, make candidates make for better candidates for sort of less invasive procedures. Trachelectomy would be the removal of just the cervix and the parametria and upper vagina. Um, that's a pretty rare operation, and uh, we were not going to talk about that one today. So next... A radical hysterectomy, as I've just shown you, is removal of the uterus with the supporting ligaments. I'm not going to get into great detail. This is not a surgical talk about the different types of hysterectomy, but a radical, um, just as a reminder, is the removal of that entire parametria from the origin of the uterine artery. It includes removal of the upper third of the vagina and often includes removal of sort of going down on the uterus sacral ligaments as well to get that complete uh, parametria. Uh, and then this is just a figure showing you where the lymph nodes are typically that are drained by the cervix and are usually removed in a complete lymphadenectomy. We don't always go all the way up the common nodes um, in a complete pelvic, usually to the mid-common iliac nodes here. And there are many more in this space that are shown in this picture, usually. So uh, and one of the advances in the last 10 years is that uh, you can consider sentinel lymph nodes for uh, cervical cancer, which is great because lymphedema is a real potential long-term complication for often these young patients. And we know that rates of lymphedema seem to be much lower, especially using borrowing from uterine cancer, which is much com more common, and we're doing a lot more sentinel lymph nodes there. So this is an advance for, for patients' quality of life. Uh, and it decreases surgical morbidity as well. So there's a lot of retros, not a lot, there's a good amount of retrospective data that shows the sensitivity of sentinel lymph nodes is quite good, 83 to 100% in a variety of series. Um, and the negative predictive value, which is perhaps the most important part if you remove it, is it indicative of the fact that there's really no disease there, is anywhere from 94 to 100%. And the false negative rate is most studies show somewhere about zero to 4%. There's one at 8%. So they are studying this in a prospective fashion, which will be very helpful to sort of uh, greater uh, adoption of this. But right now, NCCN uh, does say this is reasonable to consider, and we are doing this at the BI. Um, tumors that are less than two centimeters are the best candidates for this, but may be considered up to four centimeters, which is stage 1B2 now. And we do it uh, most commonly with this ICG green dye. You can see here, this is a near infrared uh, overlay in white light on a laparoscopic scope. Um, and this is sort of what we see when we're doing our lymph nodes. We actually have a, the ability to also do this with our open procedures um, using the same green dye and similar technology with a different sort of uh, hand piece. So we are offering this to appropriate candidates at the BI right now. Um, and any suspicious lymph nodes when you're doing sentinel lymph nodes should also be removed. And the majority of these patients, as, as just to remind you, will have had their PET scan showing no active lymph nodes because we probably wouldn't be talking about surgery if we saw that. So, um, sorry, my cursor keeps moving. So how do we do these surgeries? Um, well, as I mentioned, when I finished my fellowship in 2015, I only ever learned in the three prior years how to take care of patients with early stage cervical cancer with a minimally invasive approach, um, doing almost all of our hysterectomies um, in a robotic fashion most commonly. And in 2018, there were a couple of studies that really shook things up. Uh, they basically published a a uh, randomized control study shown here, minimally invasive versus abdominal, abdominal radical hysterectomy for cervical cancer, where they randomized over 300 patients 
in each arm to either an open surgery or a minimally invasive surgery. And they had a mix of robotic and laparoscopic, actually more laparoscopic radical hysterectomies. And they essentially followed these patients for almost five years. And what was sort of surprising to the entire community was that open surgery was actually much better than minimally invasive surgery from a disease-free survival and an overall survival um, point of view. So what you can see here is a Kaplan-Meier. I know not everyone looks at these every day like we do, but essentially what you're seeing on the left uh, y-axis is that um, this is the proportion of patients surviving over time, and those are years since randomization at the bottom. And you can see that green line on the top, the open surgery line has a higher percentage of patients surviving relative to the minimally invasive surgery line. And that was about 86% patients surviving. And again, these are our best prognosis patients, the patients who have the ability to have surgery um, over 96, uh, sorry, over 86% with minimally invasive surgery. So still good prognosis, but these are patients we should be curing. And we saw this difference between the two surgical approaches when you know, adjusting for all the covariates. And this was a randomized uh, study that was uh, international and very, very well done. Of course, this shocked the community, which had already shifted to minimally invasive surgery and seen the benefits that that has for patients. So just to add fuel to the fire, there was a second study published in that very same New England Journal journal that was a large uh, national cancer base uh, database study and SEER study. They sort of used these two sets of nationally public avail publicly available data um, around cancer, and they looked at the same question. They looked at whether open surgery or minimally invasive surgery had um, uh, better outcomes. And they had over almost 2,500 women, I believe, in this analysis. Uh, and or maybe I'm misspeaking, it might've been 2,500 women in each arm. So a bigger number, but of course, limited by the retrospective nature of the review. And again, the same outcome was replicated with open surgery being superior to minimally invasive surgery. So you can imagine uh, the shock in a large room of people at SGO when these two uh, studies were presented, kind of completely refuting the way people were practicing. The NCDB and SEER analyses also uh, went on to do some other uh, analysis, um, including looking at sort of the four-year survival rates in the United States from cervical cancer. And they, in this graph here, um, show that up here on the top in these, in the blue and then yellow bars. And then interestingly, they show the adoption of minimally invasive radical hysterectomy um, as it was happening. And you can see these black dots rising quickly and you see the, the national sort of average four-year survival rates going down, um, which again, um, more supporting evidence that this may not be the best treatment for our early stage patients. So um, in a day, I think the majority of Jewin oncologists stopped offering minimally invasive hysterectomy to at least most uh, early stage patients that were being offered surgery. And they at least were having a conversation about why there's about a 10% improved survival with open surgery. And that's certainly the way we approach things here. There are questions about, is this true for everyone? And that is what I'm showing a little bit down here. And there's some active prospective studies looking at different ways, and there's lots of hypotheses why we're seeing this difference. Is it the way that we do minimally invasive surgery? Is it the way we make the colpotomy? And so we need we still need to understand what's driving this dis difference. Uh, and so there are some ongoing prospective studies. People wonder if smaller tumors, perhaps this is not as big a risk, and that's seen here in their subset analyses, which um, you know certainly should never drive practice, but do our hypothesis generating. So, um, in addition to that, um, you know, not only in approach of surgery, but there are some lower risk patients that it seems quite aggressive to go doing a radical hysterectomy for. And so a lot of folks um, have been wondering for some time, are there a group of patients who don't need a radical hysterectomy with all that extra dissection? And uh, shown at the bottom here is sort of a review um, demonstrating um, that the rates of actual parametrial involvement may be much lower. Uh, in uh, certain candidates with really favorable histology and size and depth of invasion of their tumor and assessment for metastatic disease. 
And, and in fact, if you have many of these criteria I've sort of shown up at the top in green, your rate of having parametrial tissue involvement, which is really the main sort of additional, in addition to the upper vaginal involvement, which is much easier for us to assess preoperatively, um, the rates of parametrial involvement are quite low. So less than 1% if you have favorable characteristics. So in an attempt to uh, potentially have less surgical morbidity for these more favorable patients, there are a number of studies which are beginning to be resulted um, and uh, looking at in patients who have depth of invasion less than 10 millimeters, tumor sizes less than two centimeters, um, and no evidence of metastatic disease, varying criteria amongst these different trials, is there a way to do less radical surgery? And now that we're in the era of open <laughs> surgery, potentially these are also candidates for minimally invasive surgery. And so um, you'll see here the hypothesis of the SHAPE trial, which was um, has been at least presented, is not yet published. Um, and in that is showing that simple hysterectomy is actually not inferior to a radical hysterectomy in this well sort of selected low risk population. And again, these are patients with a greater than a 1A1, where that is the standard of care. So this would be a 1A2 or 1B1 patient. And they also have data showing that there are less uh, urologic adverse events related to surgery and postoperatively and improved um, sexual health measures in those who have a simple hysterectomy. So we may be seeing surgery shifting to more aggressive, less aggressive, and, and really much more refined based on um, preoperative risk um, evaluation. So shifting gears a little bit to the next uh, group of cervical cancers, um, this is the locally advanced group. So again, this is a group that doesn't have metastatic disease, um, but might have local extension or local nodal involvement, and that includes the pelvic imperative lymph nodes. And this group also includes stage 4A patients where it's spread into the adjacent pelvic organs, like into the bladder or the rectum. These are folks we still approach with curative, curative intent, but we don't offer surgery to because surgery alone is not gonna be curative. And again, as I mentioned, that multimodality surgery plus the chemo radiation um, can be quite morbid and you don't really need both to cure these locally advanced patients or at least to cure many of them. So um, these folks get chemo radiation I'm not a radiation oncologist, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into the weeds here, and I don't think um, most of you need, need me to. But this again is for anyone, stage one B two to four A. So obviously a wide a wide range of cervical cancers treated this way, and um, it's external beam radiotherapy now most often delivered as intensity. Uh, modulated radiation therapy, which is, as you can see, the sort of contouring lines in these uh, pretty pictures here, how they deliver sort of appropriate doses to the target areas. Um, it is given alongside uh, radiosensitizing chemotherapy, which is sort of a lower dose of weekly cisplatin, most commonly, um, given over that sort of five or so weeks of external beam, and then followed by brachytherapy. I just wanted to make the point that what we've really learned and seen a lot of in, in recent years is that um, the best outcomes are in those patients who complete their treatment without really any major treatment delays and those who also get the brachytherapy at the end of treatment. It should be standard for all patients and you really wanna make sure your patients are being treated at a center where they offer brachytherapy. Um, there's also more and more data about how that brachytherapy is delivered and, you know, with its sort of advanced imaging techniques with CT and MRI to sort of contour and provide the most sophisticated brachytherapy. But in general, there was a big concern um, in recent years because the rates of brachytherapy were declining because it's harder to provide, you know, that sort of very tailored uh, treatment in the and not all facilities can offer it. Yet our external techniques were advancing with things like IMRT. And so the concern was that it's harder to give brachy. So people are just doing their boosts and, and giving things with other more advanced radiation techniques, but they're really not as good. And, and in a very recent uh, update to sort of uh, years of, um, of overall survival in these folks who are getting the chemo RT, you can see, once again, I'm going to show you Kaplan Meyer with the blue line representing those patients who got both, you know, the external beam with the brachytherapy, and then at the bottom, those who didn't get any brachytherapy. And so there's a clear survival advantage. And these patients with, you know, somewhat locally advanced disease, we can cure 
92% of them in a recent multi-institutional study um, with over a thousand patients. So you can uh, assure your patients, uh, if you're meeting them, if you're the one making this diagnosis and it looks locally advanced, you know that there's still very much curative treatment for them. Um, and um, in other sort of exciting news, there are some updates to this. That was the standard treatment back when I finished my fellowship. But in the last year, um, and even in the last few months, one could actually argue, there have been a few presentations. We're still waiting for the full publication, so I don't want to overstate these findings just yet. But the FDA did actually act on one of them, um, approving pembrolizumab. Pembrolizumab is an immunotherapy. Um, it's a checkpoint inhibitor. You may have heard of it. It's being used to treat many other cancer types. Um, and it basically revs the immune system um, to help it also fight the cancer. So um, a recent study that was presented at the European sort of medical oncology meeting last fall, um, studies entitled Keynote A18, um, was a randomized control trial just for these patients we've been talking about getting advanced, um, sorry, getting chemo radiation for locally advanced disease. Uh, they got the chemotherapy sensitizing radiation followed by brachytherapy. But in addition to that, they added immunotherapy with the standard treatment and then as a maintenance treatment, meaning ongoing for 15 cycles after they complete their treatment. And I'm sorry, I'm showing you some more Kaplan-Myers, but the results are fairly um, exciting in that they're showing immunotherapy has a benefit in this setting. And again, these are patients we're hoping to cure. Um, and so the treatment arm with the Pembro is the lighter green there or teal, and then the maroon line is the sort of standard of care. So again, you can see that many of these patients with, with uh, this is the overall survival on this side, um, are, are surviving, 80%, 81% are surviving um, at two years with, with no death from disease, but there are there's an improvement of um, about nearly seven or eight percent in overall survival with the addition of Pembro, which um, is now approved by the FDA for this indication. There's some other trials ongoing looking at other immunotherapy, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more coming down the pipeline. Uh, and then, just to complicate things a little bit, there was an, another study in the same relative population of patients, of uh, these uh, being treated with chemo radiation, asking the question, well, what if we gave some chemotherapy first, like we do in other GYN cancers, like ovary cancer, sometimes we give chemo first to shrink the disease, and then we go in and do surgery. In this case, it's to shrink the disease and then go give uh, curative intent chemo radiation. And so they did that with, again, a randomized study. And interestingly, um, in contrast to a study, a similar study that did this looking at, could you do this before surgery for cervical cancer? This study actually showed an improvement in overall and progression-free survival um, at five years. Again, nearing 10% uh, improval in, in those numbers. So this may be something else we start doing for our patients. Again, waiting for the full publications to make any major changes to our treatments. Uh, but these are exciting findings and we are making progress. So what about the management of the most um, deadly forms of this disease, the metastatic and recurrent cervical cancers? And as I mentioned, there was exciting developments as I was leaving fellowship nearly 10 years ago um, with GOG240 with the addition of bevacizumab and anti-angiogenesis drug, so sort of blocking the blood new formation of blood supply within the tumors, added to chemotherapy, added about 3.7 months to overall survival in that population. But that's a big number to the young women who get this disease or any woman who gets this disease, often younger, um, because survival, as you can see here, was really only just over a year, 13 months. And so adding four months seems like a pretty big difference. Uh, however, um, we, you know, immunotherapy, as you just saw, um, is actually was first looked at in this setting, as we often do with cancer therapies, we look at the the sort of treatment options for those folks who really are most in need of them. We look at the new, newer treatment. So they did that with uh, pembrolizumab. They, they combined it with sort of standard chemo. And these patients had the option to receive bevacizumab also. 
And what you see here is once again, the addition of pembrolizumab has improved um, survival again, moving the needle with the bevacizumab, as you saw here, it went to about 17 months, I believe, and that was similar in the control arm for this study. But at these folks were getting uh, 24 months as opposed to one year, roughly, um, from our standard of care back when I was leaving fellowship. So that's exciting. And just to show you the the sort of trend over time and the treatment of these super advanced um, uh, cervical cancer patients, you know, Back in 2013, that's the study I've been referencing, GOG240, uh, an improvement to about a year and a half. And here we are in 2023, and we are seeing an improvement all the way up to over two years. And I will tell you, there are sub-analyses from this study, and there are other immunotherapy agents and up to three three years or more, and we're seeing that in our patients, many of whom have been offered uh, to be on trial for some of these studies and um, are receiving immunotherapy now. And so while we're not necessarily curing anyone yet, or not, not anyone that I know, but, um, our hope is that maybe someday we'll get there, but we're certainly significantly increasing the length of time a patient diagnosed with very advanced disease can survive. So with that... I will stop talking to you too much about novel targeted treatments, just to say that there are others under study and there have been others actually approved. Antibody drug conjugates, for those of you who don't know what an ADC is, is basically a targeted a drug two drug combination where one of them targets an antibody on the cell, the cancer cell, that then allows it to deliver more directly the um, cytotoxic drug into the cell. So just a, a more targeted therapy. And there are some that have been showing great promise in cervical cancer and more under study. So we're excited about these um, possibilities. But I wanted to sort of close um, to sort of bring it back to where many of you may meet these patients again, which is in surveillance or, or survival, survivorship. Uh, and sort of explain what we do here. And then when we start sending them back to you, you know now a little bit more about what we might have treated them with uh, and now what we've done in the years following. So again, many of the early stage and even early locally advanced disease patients will be cured and they will return to you, which is great. Um, and so initially we do follow them every three to six months, uh, depending on the stage of their disease. Um, with good pelvic exams. Again, I like to repeat the speculum exam, the bimanual exam, and the rectovaginal exam when I see these patients, um, if they'll allow me. Uh, the use of pap smears is often, many people ask and wonder about that. I don't strongly recommend pap screening in patients who've had radiation. Those can be hard to interpret. Certainly, if you saw a lesion or you were concerned about something, getting a pap smear is never wrong as a diagnostic tool. I do, however, in patients who only had surgery, think pap screening is very appropriate and in fact recommended. And you're really screening for a new cancer, a new HPV related disease. That HPV can stick around in the upper vagina and cause um, vaginal cancers. And, and you can also have vulvar associated HPV cancer. So a good pelvic exam for these women is necessary as long as they will tolerate it at least once a year. So once we're sending them back to that back to you, they've usually graduated out of the every six month visits and just need an annual exam or an exam anytime they have sort of symptoms or concerns. Um, and then a big part of survivorship is is thinking about their quality of life and long term symptom management because unfortunately a lot of what we do has a lot of potential long term sequelae like chronic pain, bowel obstructions, uh, issues with bowels and bladder, diarrhea, lymphedema. Um, pelvic floor dysfunction, vulval vaginal health issues like atrophy and dyspareunia, hot flashes, bone loss, um, other cancers secondary to our treatments, and then some long-term neuro and, and potentially even cardiotoxic effects of our treatment. And with the advent of immunotherapy, which I can assure you in no short order, most of our patients will be getting with any sort of slightly advanced disease, um, there are some, there can be some serious long-term effects of that as well. And then there's the psychosocial aspect, of course, of um, worsened depression, anxiety, fear of recurrence, um, and, and issues with um, concerns over altered body image issues. And it, this would not be a talk by me if I didn't address 
the financial toxicity, which for those of you who know me well know this is one of my main areas of uh, research interests. But when we look at our cervix cancer patients, there is at least half of them, if not two thirds of them experience some degree of financial hardship related to their care, treatment, follow-up. And when we ask them about their sort of cost coping mechanisms, um, over seven, they're seven times more likely than a patient who doesn't have any financial hardship to need to borrow money from friends, family, the bank, mortgage their home. And they're six times as likely to report delaying or avoiding their medical care. So these folks are high risk for you know, other medical conditions due to lack of um, follow-up or care. And so um, we should be aware of that. We're working on different ways to support our patients here at BI. We screen all of our patients for financial toxicity now and have a financial navigator we refer to um, trying to improve their compliance with their cancer care to improve their outcomes there, but also reduce the long-term risks um, that financial toxicity can have on them um, psychologically for their families and for um, their overall health. So in closing, um, I do wanna circle back to the fact that we are making great strides in treatment as you've seen, um, and we're improving survival slowly over time, but we can't forget the importance of what we're doing with vaccination, screening, and prevention, or the global burden of the disease. Here on the right is um, a hopefully optimistic uh, review of what happened in the last decade with our, our, sorry, our HPV vaccination rates. We are improving from that 20 and 40%. We're now up into the 60% range of um, all recommended uh, vaccination doses in males and females, even in the 70s of patients who received at least one of their recommended doses, but we could probably do much better. And there are uh, global mandates to do much better. So for everyone on this call, tell your friends, family, and patients that they should be vaccinated. Um, and just as a reminder for those who it's not uh, part of their everyday life, that's children, and boys and girls, ages nine to 12 is the ideal time up to 26 years, um, it is strongly recommended for unvaccinated persons. It is approved for patients up to 45, um, but here it's maybe a little bit less eff efficacious. And so shared clinical decision-making with your patients is appropriate, but regardless of their vaccination status, we need to screen everyone. Um, I definitely have within my practice, women who have gotten cervical cancer in spite of vaccination. And so it's also good just to counsel them the importance of ongoing screening. On the right though, you can see how efficacious the vaccine is. This is long-term follow-up based on the age at vaccine uh, timing. So unvaccinated there in the orange line, as you can see, highest in new incidence of cervical cancer, followed by those who got the vaccine um, up to age 30, but in those who got it less than age 17, so more in the recommended range, you can see a fairly flat line of incidence of cervical cancer, which is terrific. And globally, their WHO has uh, strongly put together a, a proposal to eliminate cervical cancer. Uh, and they sort of lose, they sort of call this the 90-70-90 rule. Their goals uh, on a global scale are to get 90% of girls fully vaccinated with the HPV vaccine by age 15. Uh, this is all, includes many countries where the access to the vaccine is somewhat limited. So this is the WHO is working hard um, with many folks trying to make that possible. And I would argue here in this country, we should be aiming for girls and boys 90%. Um, 70% of women should be screened by with a high performance screening test by age 35 and again by age 45 years of age. So in many countries, there is either no screening or a single lifetime screen, which is part of the reason we see such high rates of cervical cancer globally. Um, and so it, introducing some form of screening in the HPV test is really making that more possible with HPV self-sobs and um collection uh, as screening as opposed to cytology, which is much more labor intensive and variable in results. Uh, and then finally, that those with cervical cancer, that 90% of those with cervical cancer receive some treatment. Um, and so that those with precancerous conditions are treated, 90% of them, and those with any invasive lesions are also at least offered some management and treatment. And so with that, this is just a summary of some of the standard of care today that we have. 
um, and I will that I've just sort of reviewed and I'll leave this up and ask for um, questions if there are any. And I see um, a thank you in the chat. That's it. Thank you, Fatima. Um, does anyone have any questions? And I can either allow you to talk or you can type it into the chat. Um, Who's in Apgar? Um, I, I do hope this was helpful. Um, I welcome feedback just in general about these webinars. And if there are topics um, that you're interested in, GY and Ankh related, would be very happy for you to send me an email or let me know. Um, we all, we I think we do these on about a quarterly basis. And um, while some of the topics may be selected for the future, there's many that have not been selected. And so either suggestions on the, on the content or uh, future topics, very welcome. Otherwise, if you don't have questions immediately or they're not coming to mind, feel free to reach out in the future and I will let everyone go since it's six o'clock on Wednesday. Is it Wednesday? I think so.